All right, folks, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, hello, my name is Brian Anderson, and I'm a solutions architect at Eagle. Thanks for attending today. Looks like, by judging by the attendance, there's a lot of interest in this, tarp, this topic and Arctic Wolf in general. Uh, with me today is Lane Rausch. He's Arctic Wolf's Director of Pre-Sale System Engineering. You want to say hi, Lane? Hey, everybody. Awesome. So what is the agenda today? Well, I'm going to briefly introduce Eagle. Um, I think most of the folks on this call know who we are. After all, we've been around for 37 years, so I won't spend much time on that. I did want to spend uh, about a minute talking about why Eagle decided to partner with Arctic Wolf. Um, and then at the risk of stealing too much of Lane's thunder, I'll, I'll quickly move off that topic and we'll get straight into Lane's presentation. So a couple of formalities. If you're looking for the bathroom, it's out the main door and to the left. If you're wondering about your Starbucks gift card, after all, this is a coffee break. Uh, if you sit through the entire presentation, um, we will automatically email you a Starbucks gift card. If you don't get that, reach out to Gail Boyer, our Director of Marketing, and she'll get you taken care of. And then finally, I would encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. I'm really going to be acting as the MC for Lane today. So if I see a question that is pertinent to the screen Lane's on, I'll interrupt him. I'm good at that. Otherwise, I'll save them for the Q&A session at the end. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and get into who is Eagle. All right, there we go. So as I mentioned earlier, Eagle's been around for a while, 37 years. And simply put, we focus on the data center, right? So that starts with infrastructure, uh, storage, compute, um, networking. But that also extends to what rides on top of that infrastructure in the way of virtualization, uh, disaster recovery, data protection, business continuity in general, and of course, more and more security as a topic. Um, we do a lot of cloud and software as a service assistance as well, helping folks decide when something should maybe uh, move out to the cloud and operate as software as a service, and then of course, how to protect that. Um, what I think makes Eagle unique, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, uh, we take a best of breed approach. We prefer to go really deep on particular technologies. So we spend a lot of time deciding what we think is the best technology in that particular vertical or area. Um, and then we add a lot of expertise around that. As an example, we only carry one product in this security space with Arctic Wolf. And then of course, finally at Eagle, we add that personal touch. We take that cradle to grave mentality and we offer a lot of support and professional services around that. So why did we choose to partner with Arctic Wolf? Um, well, what, what I see when I go out and I visit customers is that in that Fortune 500 space, these guys have dedicated uh, security operations centers. They have dedicated security engineers. Um, they have a ridiculous amount of acronyms and certs on the end of their signatures, right? But these are guys that are really focused on security and they have all day to think about security. What I see with the majority of our customers uh, in that SMB space, and by the way, SMB extends into pretty large companies nowadays, is there's a lot of jack of all trades, master of nuns, right? Um, and so as a result, there's a lot of heartburn as it relates to intrusion protection, uh, worrying about things like ransomware, identity theft. And of course, that worry extends past the sysadmin. It moves up into the managers, the directors, and all the way up to the C-levels. So what we see with a lot of those mid-sized companies is they try to solve the problem with just software alone. And without stealing too much of Lane's thunder, what really makes Arctic Wolf different is they, they have the software and the technology. They have the behavioral analytics, real-time alerting, but they also bring the people. A good example of that is their dedicated security experts. So like I said, I don't want to steal Lane's thunder, so I'll stop there and hand it over to Lane. Great, thanks, Brian. All right. All right, so I, I'm gonna go through a couple things today. Um, I'm gonna talk through some of the recent news, you know, why we see a bunch of security breaches and a bunch of security issues happening. Um, I'm gonna talk through the challenges I think every company faces, regardless if you're big or small. Um, I'm gonna also walk through the evolution of security. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a, a CyberSock or an article of CyberSock introduction and give you an overview at a high level of um, exactly how we solve problems. Um, I'll give you a couple war stories. I think it's always kind of fun to, you know, hear some some stories from the trenches. Um, and then we'll just wrap it up with uh, um, some some wrap up hygiene. So 
the first thing I'm going to talk about, and I think this has become prevalent over the last few years, is um, hackers are real. You know, meaning I think we've all kind of felt that they've, you know, kind of been in the shadows and it was never, you know, criminal inter enterprises that were, were employing hackers. But the reality is, is anymore, um, this is becoming a legit threat against business um, nations. Um, and it's and we see it all the time. Um, I'm going to go through a few examples that actually have been pulled um, just from the last couple weeks. Right. So every single day we see something new. Um, but I think what's really important is that. You know, 60% of companies that, that suffer a major cyber attack or breach, um, a lot of them go out of business within six months. Um, that's a big deal because um, it's one thing to be able to protect against cybersecurity incidents, and it's, a, it's another to be able to recover from them. And a lot of times the recovery isn't just about, you know, paying a ransom or, you know, having to expose that you had a breach. A lot of the recovery has to do with identifying actually what happened at the beginning, um, so the point is, is that small businesses are actually impacted sometimes more than large enterprise um, because even though you feel like you might not be a target, um, you actually are a target because they, criminals and criminal organizations understand that you actually are not putting into a lot of the controls that the large companies are. Um, so let's just talk through a couple of these examples. So the first one, this one was really interesting. So this was actually a settlement um, that was not really... Um, cyber security. I, I always like to talk about security, more information security. This one was interesting because what happened was is it was a bunch of uh, letters around HIV drug medication that were sent out to a lot of individuals um, and the actual HIV drug was visible through uh, basically the window pane of the envelope. Um, hence, they exposed that the people that were getting those letters had HIV. This one. So this one was released, I think, last week or two weeks ago. But th what this is, is this was a, uh, a program that was written by, by a person that allowed them to use uh, Shodan.io to search for uh, basically compromised or um, uh, vulnerable systems and then automatically exploit them, automatically try to hack them. What it's done is tools have become a lot more accessible to uh, what, what we would call in the industry script kiddies, right? So it actually is not very difficult anymore to apply certain types of um, acts against exploiting vulnerable systems because the software is already released. It's out there. Um, it's about being able to follow instructions at that point. So I think we've all heard about Meltdown Inspector. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but the point is, is that um, breaches and vulnerabilities are not just software. Sometimes they're hardware. Sometimes they're firmware. Um, wherever people are able to exploit, they're going to. And the important part is, is that criminal organizations or bad guys, they only have to be right once, where security teams and, and companies have to be right every time which makes it really tough because you're always playing a cat and mouse game. This one I thought was kind of interesting. This was the Strava app that basically followed uh, fitness uh, tracking, right? So they followed different routes um, that actually exposed the layout of multiple military bases across the world. Um, it wasn't on purpose. It was just something that somebody didn't think about up front um, and it actually exposed a lot of information. Um, I'm about sick of hearing about Adobe Flash, um, but I had to throw it up there because it seems like every other week there's something else um, that, that's exposed. And then this one I thought was really interesting. So a lot of government websites um, were delivering and actually being leveraged to mine cryptocurrency. And if anybody understands anything about regulations or compliance, the government uh, follows NIST 800-53, most federal government agencies. Um, and I think that we've seen over the last few years that even the government is not immune to uh, being breached or hacked. Um, so even if you follow the most stringent controls, that doesn't mean that something like this still can't happen. Um, again, this one I thought was just kind of interesting that people from Russia were using basically high, high performance computes, uh, computers to uh, buy, mine Bitcoin. And then I had to bring this one back just because uh, it was a big one last year, but um, they've actually identified that more records were exposed than, than previously thought about. Um, the whole point here is that even if we feel like we're safe, most likely we aren't. Um, but that doesn't always mean that the risk is, is as high for your company as not. I just like to expose that this stuff is real. 
okay, why is it real? And I think that this is more important than anything is understanding kind of root cause. So if you look in 1971, there was only 23 things on the internet, right? And they were secure military mainframes. There wasn't a lot to attack. Uh, we fast forward some years, and now we have 10,000 connected hosts to the internet. We fast forward even a shorter time, and we have a million personal computers, right? So then we fast forward into, you know, 2012-ish, and now we're talking about a billion mobile devices. Fast forward in 2020, and the estimate right now is going to be around 50 billion connected devices because, of course, you have to connect your coffee maker or your toaster to the internet. Um, the, the point is, is that as the attack surface has grown, the validity of financial gain uh, by attacking these systems has also grown. And so no longer is it a, you know, kind of this subculture world where we can go attack things. It's, it's actually really prevalent and it's actually very lucrative for criminal organizations, other governments to put money and resources into actually attacking it because it actually is large enough to where they can actually make money out of it. Um, the one thing I do like to talk about here is that um, so the very first internet worm was called the Morris Internet Worm, and it was written by a guy named, guy named Robert Morris. He said that he wrote it so he could map and kind of identify, do a, a census, if you will, of what was on the internet. Um, the funny part about this is, is this internet worm leveraged uh, weak passwords and unpatched services to uh, spread throughout the internet, which sounds really familiar, right? I think that's something that we find all the time still to this day, and I don't know if that's ever going to go away. Um, one, because we're still human. Um, and I think that just having more security controls um, helps us, but it'll never eliminate the risk completely. Okay, so let's talk about the challenges people see. Um, and, and the thing is, is again, you, you are not alone as a, as a business or a company. Um, every company faces the same type of challenges. We all have social engineering challenges. There's definitely advanced persistent threats out there. There's drive-by attacks, which are, you know, people are just browsing the internet and get, get uh, infected with something or leak information. Um, we all have insiders because we all have employees. Um, and then I think one of the bigger ones that we see a lot of times is just kind of misconfigurations or, or we move too fast is the way I like to talk about that one. The next one, and this is, I think, fundamentally what Arctic Wolf, uh, you know, set out to solve um, out of the gate, which is there's just too much noise and not enough people. And I'm not talking just about alert fatigue, meaning there's a lot of information flowing your way, but there's also a lot of vendor and solution fatigue, and there's a lot of regulation and compliance fatigue. Um, and when you're getting bombarded by an industry, um, whether you're a vendor or whether you're a regulator, um, and you're getting bombarded with, you have to do this and you have to do that, Sometimes it's hard to sift through the noise and get to the practical security outcomes, um, which, which is why you need people, right? So, and I think we all understand, at least right now, is that security analysts are, be are really hard to find. Um, and I'm not talking about se security architects or people that, you know, have kind of evolved from traditional infrastructure into what we would call a security analyst. Uh, these are what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a real security analyst is somebody that's been doing SOC analytics, like triage forensics, incident handling uh, for 5, 10, 15 years. Those people are really hard to find. And this is a skill set that you, you actually, you can understand the tools and the technologies, but there's something about training your brain to see all of this data all the time. Um, that's where the talent comes from is it's a trained talent. It is not something you can just go learn from a book. It's an on-the-job training requirement. So the other thing here is that doing it yourself, this whole detection response capability is actually really tough. Um, it's more than just, I'm gonna buy a tool, set it up and forget it. So what do we do, right? So do we implement a security operations center? Do we keep buying perimeter tools and prevention tools, which most companies already have? Um, or do we, do we wait for artificial intelligence or general intelligence, right? We have a couple options here. So I want to walk through uh, at a high level just the evolution of security in general. And this is not a time-based evolution. This You could be anywhere on this spectrum. Um, it started out with basic security controls, passwords, so think identity and access management like Active Directory, patch management backups. These are fundamental to, to securing any environment. And I think most companies have tried to implement this. I'm not saying that they've all done the best job, but I think most companies have put effort in towards this. What happened is though, is it's like, okay, we've implemented basic security controls. What do we do next? 
And I think that's where we evolved and said, all right, we need to build walls, right? So we need to build the perimeter. We need to have firewalls and spam filters and web filters, and we probably need to have application firewalls and proxy systems, um, which work. And you absolutely need to have these things in place. Um, we always like to talk about secure, security being a journey, not a destination. You don't buy one thing in security and then call it a day. Um, but the next one was really about perimeter and building that wall. As soon as companies realize that the wall is not perfect, right? So there's, you have employees that are already inside and sometimes the wall just falls down, whether it's a misconfiguration or it's just outdated. The point is, is it's not, it's not 100%. So we evolved into defense in depth or prevention technologies, right? So we started looking at things like we need to put antivirus or um, advanced endpoint prevention tools. We need to do uh, data loss prevention, right? We need to have um, some sort of in, internal or external IPS system. The point is, is that it was, okay, now that people have gotten through the walls, how do we make sure and prevent data exfiltration, data extortion, uh, denial of service attacks? Um, but now when you start looking at it, a lot of companies are feeling, okay, well, I've done this, I've bought this stuff, but I look around and my peers in the industry are still getting breached. So how come I don't feel safe? And the reality is, is it's it because the next step in this evolution is really a security operations center. It's how do we take all of this information, all this telemetry, how do we add additional threat intelligence on top of it? But more importantly, how do we assign a human that's actually done this before to identify gaps in our posture? And how do we make sure that we can actually hunt for threats within the environment? So that way, if our perimeter and prevention tools fail to stop something, they, the, those people or those hackers or those criminals that are within the organization can't stay there for a long period of time and set up a mass attack. The next evolution, after you can do really good detection response and you've done the aggregation and you've built out this process of being able to identify um, anomalous behavior, now you start talking about containment and remediation. Like how do we make sure and you know, shut things down until we can re-image the machine, for example, or reset the password? Um, this is where I would believe most companies in the world are today, right? Most companies have implemented some sort of perimeter prevention and basic security controls. And I believe that this is where most companies want to be, right? Now, this is a gap and there's a big gap here. And what you'll find is, is that Arctic Wolf plays about here, right? So the, the human aspect, which I'm going to talk a fair amount about, um, is important to, to articulate that each one of these steps requires a higher degree of um, human intelligence to implement and run. Um, so installing Active Directory and being able to do, you know, passive resets and account creation and deprovisioning is, is a lower skill set than somebody that needs to actually do triage forensics and incident handling. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about artificial intelligence because um, I think this is where we're at a little bit in the industry. So this is going to go a little off of uh, off topic from an Arctic Wolf perspective. This is a this is a Lane Roush inside of my brain a little bit, um, but I think it's an important topic that we we should talk about. So the reality is is that artificial general intelligence does not exist today, right? So there's tons of AI, there's tons of machine learning out there. Um, it absolutely is a huge component of becoming more secure and getting higher fidelity alerts and identifying and getting rid of noise. We use it all the time within our platform, but it's not general intelligence, right? It still doesn't operate within the gray areas. Look, the first computer that ever beat us was IBM's Deep Blue, um, who beat Gary, Gary Kasparov. Um, I think this was the time where people started thinking, wow, this is actually possible that machines can become smarter than humans. And if we fast forward a little bit, right, the next one was Lee Settle. Um, who, honestly, I don't think anybody ever thought that uh, we were going to get beat by a computer at the game of Go because it requires so much intuition. Um, he, got, he got whooped, to be honest with you. Um, and I think that this was the time where people said, holy cow, machine learning AI is going to 100% disrupt the world. Um, and then the last one was uh, our, our friend Watson, right? Um, and, and beat Ken Jennings and handedly. Uh, my favorite quote here is uh, when, when Ken got beat, he basically said, I, for one, uh, welcome our new computer overlords. And, and I think it's kind of a funny concept because what happened here is that computers can learn really, really fast when, you, when there's rules. So if you look at each one of these, these components, the key here is that 
there's rules in it, right? There's a box within it. And when you start talking about um, when you start talking about security in general, there's no rules. It's very gray, which requires you to still have a human involved to make sure we identify what's real and what's not. Um, just real quick, if you ever want to go look this up, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick paraphrase on this, but everybody always believes that you know when we if if AI or machines take over the world, it's going to be very Terminator like. The reality is is that um, there's a concept called the paperclip maximizer theory, and th what what it's saying is that it's going to be unintended consequences that actually cause our demise, right? So if you set up a, a machine that has general intelligence to do nothing but output and maximize output of paper clips, and they're doing that and they run out of, let's say, raw material, and they look at you and say, hey, I could probably build 10,000 paper clips out of you. Or they say, hey, I need to build a, another manufacturing plant. So they basically clear a bunch of cropland, build a manufacturing plant, protect it, and now we can't grow food. Um, so what I'm getting at here and the whole point of this conversation is that once we have artificial intelligence with general intelligence, right, so the singularity, we're going to have a lot more problems to worry about than who stole your social security number. So in the meantime, yes, AI is important. Yes, machine learning is important. But just understand that in order to actually secure your business from a practical sense, you still need security humans, right? You need humans to be able to actually articulate the value as well as identify the anomalies within the environment. That's why this guy's scared, <laughs> by the way. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the nuts and bolts. So this is the NIST cybersecurity framework at a high level. Um, but what's, what this is really showing is, and, and so you understand, most companies have done a really good job of investing in one, two, and five, right? So most companies have invested a large amount of money, time, and resources into identifying their threats, like having an asset management system, understanding their risk in their, their business. Um, they've spent a ton of their security budget. I would probably say 90 plus of their percent of their security budget on the protection aspects, right? So that is going to be the prevention technology. That's going to be the access control training, um, just kind of the overall IT architecture. And then I think five, a lot of companies have actually done a really good job of things like business continuity. How are we going to operate as a business if something does happen? It doesn't always have to be skewed in the, in the sense of security. Um, but if you've already laid the groundwork of business continuity from an IT operations perspective, you can adapt a lot of that framework to, to a security incident response as well. Where companies have not invested um, very much, very many resources, especially um, small to medium enterprise businesses, is in the detection and response um, pillars of this framework. And there's a real good reason for this. Most of the time, security has become a function of IT, not necessarily a standalone business unit, which ultimately means that we've attacked the problem the same way we've attacked something like a CRM or an electronic medical record system, which is how do we buy software and a piece of technology? How do we get it all configured so then it can just run? Well, when it comes to detection and response, as soon as you actually build out uh, a SOC, a SIM, right, the components that you need to actually do this, that's when the real work begins, right? So it's not about just getting something set up. It's about how do you drive value out of it? Um, and once you start talking about requiring people um, to run a service, now you have to really start weighing your risk versus reward. Um, the risk of being attacked could be low, but the risk of if you are attacked, your business being majorly impacted is very high. So that's where there's this offset of, okay, how do we invest and show that we need to do this when we may or may not get you know, breached or hacked, but on the other side, if we do, we could go out of business. Right. And that's a hard concept to go through, which is why companies like Arctic Wolf exist, is to help bridge this gap. Um, this is how we do it. So at a high level, we basically deliver a security operations center as a service. We do that with a comprehensive unified view. Um, we do it by, by doing it 24 by 7 and we do it in a very predictable pricing model. So what we've done. Um, so one thing that uh, our chief architect likes to talk about is what we're doing is not necessarily physics hard, right? Um, Security Operations Center has been around for a long time, and I believe that there's a lot of companies, military, government, that actually do a pretty good job of doing this. Um, it's actually diet hard, 
right? It's about how do you do it efficiently, repeatable, in a way that you know that can be affordable to companies. Um, that's the hard part of this. And so that's what Arctic Wolf has, has done, is we've basically built a um, service to give you the outcome of a security operations center and access to those security talented or the talented security people without having to charge you an arm and a leg to do it. So this is what we do at a, at a, at a higher level. Um, so the core fundamental uh, benefit of Article of Networks is we do threat management, which basically means we actually get full visibility across the environment and we leverage that information to identify um, potential risks, right, or security incidents. The whole goal is to take something that got through your perimeter and prevention tools and actually identify and make sure that it's a real security incident. And you want to do that before it becomes a breach. Um, that's fundamentally what we're doing is we're hunting in the environment, we're bringing our own threat intelligence to the, to the table as well as the other telemetry you have, and we're hunting. Um, now inherently, because of where we sit and the way we do this by, by assigning you a named security engineer, we, we reduce cyber risk. And we do this by a multitude of ways. So the first way is, is obviously just looking at the environment and making sure things are configured correctly and making sure that we're seeing people or things that are in your network that shouldn't be. Um, but we also have strategic conversations with you. So, for example, if we see that you've been successfully fished, let's say, four or five times in the previous quarter, it actually makes sense that if you don't have multi-factor authentication, that should be a conversation that, that we have with you. Now, we don't necessarily, you know, resell uh, multi-factor auth or anything like that. We partner with other uh, technology providers like Eagle Technologies um, to make sure that you guys get whole. But then once you actually implement that, we, we will integrate that into our system as well. Now, the key here is that we're bringing a unified security posture, which means we're not asking you to go buy a SIM, we're not asking you to buy a bunch of hardware and software. Um, we're bringing the software, the technology, the people, the process to actually deliver this outcome in a service-based approach. Um, and then the last thing I'll touch on is the security operations effectiveness. What this is really talking about is sometimes we get hung up on um, you know, it's a piece of ransomware or malware, or it's a successful fish. Yes, we detect and identify that stuff all the time, but there's also other components to this, which is things like, hey, you have an any, any rule in your firewall um, that's allowing traffic from Russia to communicate in. Well, that's a problem, right? We need to identify that, and if you don't have somebody with a security mindset looking at that, you might miss it. Um, at a high level, and we can go deeper into this um, if you want to follow up after this, but what we're doing is we're basically putting a hardened Linux appliance inside your firewall. We're doing network inspection. We're aggregating all sorts of different telemetry from all sorts of different applications. We're aggregating that up into our system, and we're basically applying a human to run through that information and identify threats. Okay, I'm going to talk through a couple war stories, um, and I think that you know sometimes putting this into practice and understanding. Um, the types of things we're finding is important. So this one was pretty interesting. So this one was, um, we basically had put our sensors in place and what we did was we, we identified that um, an IT staffer was actually using production servers to mine Bitcoin. Um, what's really interesting about this one and it, and, you know, was that when we actually found this, we escalated it once to our contact um, and it went away. And then, uh, we identified it again, and basically what ended up happening was, is it was one of the system administrators that had actually brought us into, into the company, um, which means we had to actually escalate it outside of, of that person. And unfortunately, um, the, the employer did have to terminate them. But what I'm getting at here is that um, <laughs> if you believe, right, that you're doing something wrong, bringing in a security company that monitors your security environment is probably not the best idea. All right, this one for me was, is actually one of our favorite stories. So what happened here was, um, again, we had a sensor in place and we actually identified triggers of ransomware, right? So we saw basically a bunch of ransomware triggers hit from a machine at a remote office. Um, the problem was is that the ransomware was a variant that could not infect Linux. Um, but it was a Linux box that was actually triggering these alerts. Um, so as we started actually opening up an incident, doing uh, more forensics around the incident with the customer, um, 
look, some companies actually would have just closed this and said, look, it's a false positive. It, you know, it, it can't encrypt the machine, like let's move on. But having a human sitting there going, no, 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 there, there's something wrong, escalating that out. What ended up actually happening was it was a remote employee that had actually spun up a Kali Linux box and was distributing and building ransomware as a service packages. Um, so even though it wasn't necessarily ransomware that was encrypting systems, it was a bad actor within the company um, that was leveraging company resources to, uh, to basically do bad things. Um, so the last thing, or the last story I'll tell you is, is again, I, one of my favorite ones is, so we had actually put a sensor in place, um, and as we were starting to look, this was actually within like the you know, first couple hours of us getting to know them and getting to know the environment. Um, what happened was, is we identified, again, a human was looking through and they identified that one of the web servers was actually doing DNS queries and lookups out to Battle.net. Um, a security engineer being kind of a nerd at heart, um, understood what Battle.net and Blizzard was. And what ended up happening was that it was a web server. Um, we grabbed the logs, we started looking, and that web server had actually been infected with a remote access Trojan. Um, and somebody in China had installed a World of Warcraft gaming server um, on that web server and was just leveraging it for, for the resources, bandwidth and compute. Um, the thing is, is that web server was actually um, the front end to an electronic medical record system. So that web server had been completely owned. Um, they could have absolutely leveraged that to get electronic medical records, um, but that's not what they were going after. They were going after resources. So um, again, it comes down to making sure that humans are in the loop and looking at these systems um, to make sure that, that, that companies are being protected. So before I go to the last slide, um, I wanted to make sure, I didn't put a slide in here, but I wanna make sure and, and reiterate one thing. So. Getting started with a service like Arctic Wolf is actually really simple. So it's not the same as, you know, buying software and then you have to go procure servers and you have to get them set up in your network and then you have to install it, right? And then we have to, you know, do some professional services to come in and get it all configured and then you have to train your users to use it, right? Like that process is usually months, um, sometimes years, depending on how large the project is, um, before you even have time to value. With Arctic Wolf, because we've actually operated and built this platform as a service or an outcome-based approach, it's actually pretty straightforward. We identify um, kind of how many sensors you need in your environment, we identify how many users, how many servers, and then what we do is we pre-configure these sensors, we drop ship them to your locations, um, we plug them into the network, and then we configure some of the other log sources to send to us, and at that point, you're already coming into a very highly tuned system um, that's already providing output, and then we just continuously over time work with you to make sure the system's tuned and we're giving you the right information. Um, it, the, the time to value for us is really, really short. And to get up and running and get that SOC outcome does not need to be a month, you know, months long project. Um, so the last thing I'm going to touch on, and I think that this is actually really critical, is I think every person, um, regardless of what company you work for, um, you have a responsibility to have some personal security hygiene as well. Um, I can actually tell you, um, I know specifically of a couple of incidents where um, a person has been fished at home with their iTunes credential. Um, that iTunes credential was then leveraged to basically uh, hack into their Office 365 account, um, identify kind of the top 100 um, people in their environment or their, their address list, and basically send out an a, um, uh, infected PDF. Um, because company or people normally uh, reuse passwords, that's actually a pretty easy thing to do for, for hackers. So don't think that if they're not targeting your, your business environment, they're, they're probably targeting your personal as well. So some of the things I can tell you is you should always use a password manager from a personal perspective. Um, they're easy to use. They're not expensive. Um, for example, I don't actually know what any of my passwords are to get into my platforms. Um, I have to go into my password manager to get that information. Um, and you can rotate those passwords very easily as well. The second thing I would say is um, if, you're good, if you do travel and you're on unsecure networks, um, so unsecure Wi-Fi, 
you should always use a VPN. They're again, very inexpensive, um, but I'll tell you it's really, really easy, especially wireless, for me to take over your connection and become the man in the middle and start sniffing your passwords or easily fish you or infect your machine. It's almost trivial anymore with, with certain products that you can just buy off the shelf. Um, but if you have a VPN, this becomes a lot tougher for people. Um, and then I had to put it in here. This is the email I sent out to my family and friends around Equifax. I'm assuming you guys have all done this, but I figured it makes sense to at least make sure um, and tell you again, like, you should go freeze probably your credit reports. Um, everybody on this call, I guarantee you, was, uh, was impacted. All right, so I tried to keep it to about 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Brian, and then if we have any questions, I can go ahead and answer them. All right, moving back over. All right, Lane, that was great, by the way. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, so I think some of these questions you already handled, but a lot of folks asked questions about how this looks in the environment. So you, you mentioned a, a Linux appliance. Is that a physical appliance or some sort of an OVA that, that's virtualized? It's a good question. So these are hardened Linux boxes. Um, we have kind of two models. Um, we have one for, think of it, under 50 users and one for over. That's kind of simplified. Um, but these are hardened Linux boxes that normally we either go in line. So think of it as a, uh, a tap right, a tap model, which is, you know, take your cable that's plugged from your firewall to your switch, you plug it into port one of our sensor, take another cable, put it into port two of our sensor and go to the switch, and now we're a bump in the wire. Um, that's good for certain deployments, so think kind of like uh, office locations, things like that. But we also um, uh, support and, and recommend in certain scenarios span um, or mirror configurations to get, to get visibility in the network. Um, OV, and I'll address the virtual machine one just real quick because I think it's important. When you're actually doing network inspection, so if you think of a TAP or an IDS type module, um, actually getting that information spanned into a virtual um, hypervisor is actually a lot of work. And so having a physical appliance, uh, believe it or not, is actually easier to deploy than trying to set up a bunch of span ports that traverse uh, distributed virtual switches and things like that. That's why we've stuck with the hardware model. Virtual machines are good for log aggregation only usually. Okay, excellent answer. So you do do some log aggregation, correct? Absolutely, so the sensors themselves um, do act as log aggregators. So we take, we take you know, active directory, server logs, especially server logs that are prod or under compliance. We take router switches, we'll take endpoint logs. Uh, so like if you have, you know, an endpoint security solution, we'll take those firewall logs. Um, you kind of name it like we're going to take it. Um, the key is, though, is we don't we don't require those log sources to do our detection. Right. So for us, those log sources are actually to help us tune and eliminate false positives, because if you can take, hey, there was a potentially malicious binary or somebody's calling out to command and control. And I can actually correlate that across firewall logs, endpoint logs, author, authorization or auth logs. Um, I now can have a really good picture of not only who was impacted, what was impacted, what time it was impacted, and do we and what the urgency of the matter is. Okay, so um, you guys talk a lot about dedicated security experts. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Is there really a guy named Jeff that you call when you have a problem that he reaches out to you when you have a problem? It's a great question. So, yes, we, we basically assign a primary and secondary named uh, concierge security engineer. Um, those engineers, again, are not like, you know, they're not normal system administrators that, you know, have, have traditionally just done infrastructure. These are, these are top tier security talent that have very um, high degrees of incident handling responsibilities. They know how to hunt. They've been doing analyst work for a long time. Now, don't get me wrong, they're not the only people in our security operations center that handle your account though, right? Um, when you have those type of people, they're responsible for your security outcome, but they have a team that also helps them do that, whether it's base level triage or, you know, you don't necessarily want that type of person, you know, having to configure sensors and ship them out and verifying they're talking, right? So they drive a team, but ultimately when you call us, that's who you can talk to or who you're gonna talk to as your primary engineer. Okay. So um, I had a couple of questions about re remediation, and I think what they're asking is, is once you guys have identified a threat, um, what do you do to help remediate the problem? 
I love it. So remediation is becoming a pretty hot conversation um, in this space. So let's let's level set on the things that we find. So when we're talking about remediation specifically, there's kind of two types. So the first type is if we identify and have validated for 100% certainty that this machine needs to have, you know, be re-imaged, for example, what we're doing is we're doing the hard work of making sure to identify what the security incident is, what the impacted devices or users are, and then giving you the identification or plan of this is what you have to go remediate. The key there is those remediation functions are IT functions almost always, right? So re-imaging a computer, resetting passwords, adding or removing a firewall ACL, patching a system, those are all functions of IT that have been in place forever. So just be careful when you start talking about how do you remediate security issues, that's one side of it, which is basically the IT side. So if you're looking for you know, a company like an Arctic Wolf to remediate that section, what you're really talking about is how do we outsource IT? Okay, so that's the first one. That's important to know. The second side of that is, okay, now that Arctic Wolf has actually done the investigation, the understanding that there's, a, there's an actual security breach, so you know, your, your EMR system um, had a piece of malware on it, and then we identified that somebody actually you know, uh, compromised a, a database credential, and then we grabbed database logs, and we saw that they actually did uh, select and they grabbed data. I'm not saying we can go as far as, as digital forensics because that's not our specialty, but if we have any inclination that there was an actual breach within the environment, what we would do is we actually partner with specific companies um, that you can, you can help, you know, you can partner with as well to do digital forensics. And the reason I say that that's not necessarily part of a traditional SOC is because doing legit digital forensics requires um, a very specialized human. Um, it's not just about how do we take an image of a machine and find something, it's how do, we, how do we make sure that we have chain of custody and am I willing to actually go on the stand and defend my position? And so we've found that just like we're not gonna go try to manage firewalls, um, it's also really important to make sure that you hone in and do something really well. And digital forensics and taking the stand for true incident response, um, that's a different, that's a different val uh, vector. And it's important to know that um, just because somebody says, hey, we provide on-site incident response, does not necessarily mean that they're going to go take the stand and be able to get you out of your legal predicament. Excellent. This is really great, by the way. Um, so another question that I got a couple of times is, could you compare and contrast what you guys do uh, versus uh, penetration testing or a pen test? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's kind of funny. So penetration tests, right, are gonna be more about how do we go into an environment? How do we identify vulnerabilities and then actually try to exploit them, right? How far, how deep can we get? Can we actually exfiltrate the crown jewels? Um, so it's a lot more about how do we go test the security controls in place, where what we're doing is we're monitoring for those types of things, right? So um, for us, it's about um, we don't do penetration tests. We're not a pen test company. And the reason is, is because it's almost a little bit of the fox in the hen house, right? Do you really want the person that's writing your controls, testing your controls, also the same people that are monitoring your controls, right? And so um, there's a difference between a pen test and tactically or operationally monitoring your environment. Um, I would also say, again, this is a Lane Roush opinion, is that although pen tests are super valuable, a lot of times when you put something like an Arctic Wolf or a monitoring system in place and a security analyst on top of it, um, you already kind of know where your gaps are, right? So you kind of already understand like, yep, they'll be able to penetrate that location. Um, sometimes, honestly, user education can be a better pen test or a better use of your money than even a pen test. Um, again, though, all of these technologies, all these services, um, it's, a, it's a belt and suspenders approach to security. None of them are bad. <laughs> um, so the more you do, obviously, the better. Um, but that's why we don't do pen tests, and that's how we're a little different, is we're monitoring that outcome versus testing it. Okay, so kind of a yes or no. Would you recommend someone continue to do penetration, penetration testing along with a solution like Arctic Wolf? Yeah, yeah, so you'll find that this is my take on most things is um, I, would, I would do as much as you can from a security posture. So the things that we're going to do, for example, is we're going to do an external vulnerability assessment every month, and we're going to monitor, we're going to identify if there's critical or high. 
But what we're not going to do is we're not going to call in and try to social engineer, right, the front desk staff. Um, I think a penetration test is still valuable. So I, I would never tell you not to do it. Um, I, that's just not that's just not the way we we operate. Um, honestly, in this day and age, the more security you have, the better. Okay. So uh, really rounding out the, the last of the questions I have, most of them are really uh, about licensing and how the product is priced. Um, you know, kind of in an elevator style, a minute or less, could you just kind of talk about how this is priced on a quote? I can. So this is actually one of the areas that we are a little bit different than than a traditional like SIM or co-managed SIM. So a lot of a lot of the way that businesses monitor or license their solution is kind of based on um, unquantifiable metrics, right? So an unquantifiable metric is things like log volume or bandwidth or events per second or you know limit the number of times that an incident can can be escalated, right? So. What happens in that scenario is that you now have to make decisions from a financial perspective um, that could put your security at risk. So the way that Arctic Wolf licenses, licenses our service is based on an attack surface um, and what we would call an effort-based model. And what that really means is we basically identify um, out of your attack surfaces, whether it be on-premises, whether it be cloud, and we identify users, servers, and then the number of sensors that we have to put in place to monitor your environment. And then everything we do is just included in that subscription model. There's no professional services like onboarding fees. Um, there's no log volume limitations. Um, what happens is, is what we're trying to do is align our goals with your goals. Your goals are to be more safe. Our goal is to provide you a secure outcome. Um, the only way to do that is to have more data, right? And so if all of a sudden you say, well, wait a sec, I don't want to send you that server's data uh, because it's going to cost me more money. And we're going, yes, but we really need that piece of information or telemetry to make sure that we give you a rounded service. Um, that's why we model the way we do. So users, servers, sensors um, is kind of the core um, uh, licensing component. And then there's a few other things that we add on there. So like if you have longer data retention requirements, there's a few things like that. But for the most part, it's really straightforward. It's a small skew bucket and everything we do is included in that, that subscription rate. Okay, so it's kind of a mix of an interview and maybe a collection utility. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, actually, most of the time, we don't even need a collection utility. It, it, most companies understand, you know, how many egress points they have, um, how many firewalls they have, kind of how many servers and how many users. Um, honestly, we usually can get configurations that are very accurate on, on like a 20-minute phone call. Awesome. All right, I, I only have one more question, and I think this guy was kidding around, but he asked if I could add a security <laughs> exception so that he could continue to mine Bitcoins at work. <laughs> uh, let's just <laughs> let's just put it this way. I guess if you're uh, if you're the CEO of a of a mining company, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I felt like it was worth asking. It's, it's so witty. Um, <laughs> All right, Lane, that was great. I mean, we're pretty much at the end of this presentation. I, I always like to talk about next steps. So in terms of next steps, we, we can obviously come on site. And we can talk about this in a little more detail and how it pertains to your environment. Um, we can always show you a demo. Um, so if you're a guy like me that kind of sees with his eyes, right, in his hands and wants to see the product and touch it, that's a great way to get closer to Arctic Wolf. And then finally, uh, get a quote. Um, you know, as Lane explained, the quote, it, it, it matters how your environment is architected and how many sensors you have. So it's really hard to toss out a number without understanding what your environment looks like. Is that, is that fair to say, Lane? It is. And I, the one thing I will say is, is when you start talking about security operations center, if you actually go and try to compare this to do it yourself, like what we're talking about is a fraction of the cost, right? And so just know that like, even though sometimes what I'm talking about feels like it's going to be this arm and a leg, um, I think you'll be surprised at, at how affordable I think we've made this, especially when you compare it to other options in the industry and other, uh, you know, do-it-yourself activities. Awesome. Well, we're right at 50 minutes. This is perfect. Uh, Lane, I really appreciate your time. Like I said, we're more than willing to, to get on site and have a personal conversation around this. Um, at the end of the day, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or to reach out to your account executive. Um, if you don't get your, your coffee gift certificate, make sure you reach out to Gail and yell at her. Um, and, and with that, um, I'll thank you for your time and I'll sign off. Lane, is there anything you want to say as you exit? 
I just want to say thanks to uh, you and Eagle Technologies and then all the attendees that joined. Um, we'll look forward to uh, talking to you guys all again. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Have a good week.